I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I await, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. God is good. And all the time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to our friends online, wherever you are. God sees you and God loves you. And we are grateful for your spiritual presence with us across the thousands of miles, wherever you may be. God is a good God. Do you agree with me? That agreement was weak, but if that's all you can give, I'll take it. But let me try again. God is a good God. Amen. All right. <laughs> the fact that we're few doesn't mean our enthusiasm has to be little. Remember, when God told Gideon, go fight the Midianites, Gideon came up with an army of about, what, 33,000 or 32,000, some of that, 33,000. God said, too many. Reduce your ranks. He reduced them by 10,000 to 20,000. Too many. God took him all the way down to 300. From 33,000 to three measly hundred. And God told him, don't pull a sword, don't fire a shot. Just take a, a horn, a lantern, and a pitcher. Put the, the lantern in the pitcher, break it, blow the horn, leave the rest to me. Now, who fights a battle like that? You see, God likes all the credit. Can you say amen? amen. So even though we're few, when we have big enthusiasm, only God can do that. All right. Our subject for this evening, get out and stay out. What did I say? Get out and stay out. Mm -hmm. Some people get out and they look back. No, get out and stay out. Remember Lot's wife? She got out of Sodom physically. But her heart was still in Sodom. So she got out, but looking back. When God tells you get out, get out and stay out. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are who you are. Loving, kind, forgiving, long-suffering, patient, tender-hearted. Forgive us where we offended you today, Father. Why would we offend someone who's so loving and sweet? Forgive us. Father, come close to us now in the presence of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of life, and the Spirit of grace. As we bow before you today, God, open our minds, open our eyes, that we may receive the words of life. I humble myself before you today, God. I am dirt. You know that. But I didn't make myself today, God. You made me dirt. Now put strength in this dirt, that the glory may come to you. Speak through me. Fill me with your spirit. Grant me humility, but grant me boldness. As I speak to your people, remind me I too am a sinner, and I need grace. Bless all those who came. Bless all those online. Remember those online who are not Seventh-day Adventists. Touch them in a very special way. Bless the little boys and the little girls who are watching Father. Because the devil wants them. But Jesus died for them. Dear God, bless all nations represented by those watching, but particularly our host nation of these United States. Father, let me only say what glorifies you and blesses your people. Place your hand upon the sick right now, dear God, and do something miraculous for them. Somewhere around the world, someone is in prison who is innocent. In the name of the Jesus Christ who gives us freedom, bring that person out. Because you're not a God of injustice. Somewhere around the world right now, someone is about to suffer violence. Stop it, Father. Stop it. Someone's about to suffer from hunger. Do something, dear God. Whether the person follows you or not, do it because that's the way you are. You love to ease suffering. Father, I'm not telling you what to do. I am asking you. Now, God, bless not only us, but wherever your people are worshiping you tonight, bless them, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. There's a prayer I offer every day. Let me move fast. It's already 23 after. I ask God every day, Father, this is exactly how I tell him. Under every heading of human suffering, deliver at least one person right now. 
One person. There's someone in Ukraine dealing with a gunshot wound. There's someone in some country that just lost both parents, and the little boy is eight. Somewhere some man is about to physically beat his wife. Somewhere a rebel soldier has been captured by the government soldiers. He's about to be tortured. Or vice versa. Somewhere someone is suffering right now. And my prayer every day is, Father, please deliver somebody just to ease suffering. Some woman is about to give childbirth and she's about to die in childbirth. Stop it, God. Amen. Just ease suffering. Ah, this world is overrun with suffering, but it's not God's fault. Right. No. God put Adam and Eve in a perfect world. They chose to sin. All the, the plagues came upon this world. It is not God's fault. But that's not my sermon. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Let me slow down. You're not, you, you don't ever rebuke me for going too fast. I don't know why. I'd be so happy. Maybe you're so nice you don't rebuke preachers. But you must tell me, slow down, slow down. And I will slow down immediately as if you're a policeman. Do you have Genesis 1? Yes. Let's read from verse 1. Our subject is? In the beginning, get out and stay out. Yes, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, telling us immediately that the darkness was what? <clears throat> yeah, it's not good. God doesn't separate good from good. Are you with me? He separates good from evil. He separated the light from the darkness. Now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's read verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. It's 25 after 7. I'll probably go to 10 after 7. I hope you don't mind. All right. 2 Corinthians 6, reading verse 14, our subject, get out and stay out. You have 2 Corinthians 6, written by the Apostle Paul. Verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Stop. Let's go over those five questions again that God puts to us through Paul. And you Give me the answer. Verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? None. None. <laughs> and what communion hath light with darkness? None. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? None. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? None. Or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? None. In God's eyes, light and darkness are not supposed to mix. Welcome, my good brother, welcome. They are not supposed to mix. Now, what Paul is saying when he said, what fellowship, what communion hath light with darkness, he is taking that all the way back from Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. My listening friends, in online, in person, God wants darkness and light separated. Let's take a look at what darkness represents. Go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, we read verse 13, our subject, get out and stay out. Colossians, also written by Paul, chapter 1, reading verse 13. 
When you found it, say amen. amen. I'd like you to read with me, but uh, find those texts as quickly as you can. Colossians 1, reading verse 13. Are you there now? Amen. Who hath delivered it from what? The power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He hath delivered us from the what? Power of darkness. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. Let's read verse 12. For subject, get out and stay out. Ephesians couple of books before Colossians. Do you have it? Chapter 6, verse 12. Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me. I ask you sincerely, in Jesus' name, amen. Read with me. You know it very well. What does that say? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The rulers of the what? Darkness of this world. We have darkness negatively presented again. Stay in Ephesians, but this time go to chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Paul gives a list of sins in verses 3, 4, and 5. Now, read verse 6 with me of Ephesians 5. What does that say? Let... No man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon whom the children of disobedience. Be not ye partakers with them, for ye were sometimes what? Come on, read. For ye were sometimes, but now are ye light in the Lord. What does he mean, ye were sometimes darkness? They were practicing a life contrary to thus saith the Lord. Now the verse doesn't mean they did not have a church. Pagans have their churches. I didn't say that properly. Let me try again. Paganism is a religion. The Egyptians had a religion. God told the Israelites, get out of Egypt. Sodom and Gomorrah had a religion. God told Lot, get out. When God brought the Israelites out, he told them, don't do what those other nations did. All those other nations had a religion, but it was not the religion of the God of heaven and earth. He was sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. What am I trying to say? The subject, get out, stay out. We go back to Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God wants light and darkness separate. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Now, go to Matthew 5. Let's read from verse 13 of Matthew 5. This is Jesus Christ himself who described himself as the truth. He also says, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. We're listening to the light of the world. Matthew 5, reading from verse 13. What does the Bible say? He are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Next verse, ye are the light of the world. Stop. If ye are the light of the world, what condition is the world in? Darkness. Darkness. Mm. This is not being politically incorrect. This is not being arrogant. This is interpreting the Bible. If ye are the light of the world... The world has no light unless you shine. Now keep in mind in Matthew 5. Go to verse 1 of Matthew 5. Read with me. What does that say? And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught, what's the last word? Them saying, taught them now. Jesus went up into the mountain to get away from the multitudes. But they followed him. But he went to speak to his disciples. Because the Sermon on the Mount is not for the multitudes. The Sermon on the Mount is for the believer. Turn your cheek. That's not the multitude. That's the believer. Are you with me? 
If any man will compel you to go a mile, go twain. That's for the believer. And so Jesus spoke to his disciples, but the multitudes listened. Keep this in mind now. We have the disciples and we have the multitudes. Now, listen to verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. To whom is Jesus speaking? Not to the multitude. Because the disciples were to be a light to the multitude. You and I are called to be a light to the world. We are not called to be a part of the world. But when we do that, we cease to be light. And Jesus said, can, two, uh, can the blind lead the blind? They will both end up where? In the ditch. Having said all of that, let's go to F, not, uh, Exodus. I almost said Ephesus. Exodus. The second book of the Bible, Exodus. Let's go to chapter 4. We'll read 22 and 23 of Exodus. Do you have it? Who wrote Exodus? No, very good. Very good. You get you an A for that. Moses. Do you have verse 22? Read with me. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let, come on, my son go, my firstborn, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Observe why God told Pharaoh, let my son go. And by son, he means the Israelite nation. Because sometimes the entire nation is called the son. All right. Let my son go. Why? That he may serve me. What does the Bible mean by serve? Go to Joshua 24. Joshua 24. Let's read verse 24, I think it's Joshua 24, 24. You have Joshua 24, the last chapter of Joshua. Under Joshua, the Israelites were fairly obedient to God under Joshua and his elders. But when they passed away, they went off in all kinds of crazy lifestyles. You have Joshua 24, verse 24. In the previous verses, Joshua tells the Israelites, you're in the Canaan land, you're in the promised land, obey God. Don't follow idols. Obey God. He's urging them, obey God. Do what God tells you. Obey God. What do they say in verse 24? Read for me. And the people said, Done to Joshua, the Lord, our God, will we? And his voice will be? Yes. To serve is to obey. Same thing. The Lord, our God, will we serve? His voice will be obey. So when God tells Pharaoh in Exodus 4, verse 23, Let my son go that he may serve me, what is God really saying? That he may obey me. Because Israel could not obey God while they were in Egypt. Are you with me? Where you are affects your obedience to God. Let's go to chapter 5 of Exodus, the very next chapter. Let's read verses 1 and 2, our subject, get out and stay out. 25 minutes to 6, 2 or 7. Chapter 4, 25, 1 and 2. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, what? Exodus 5, 1. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Why? That they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. They couldn't do it in Egypt. Are you following me? They couldn't do it in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. Then Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should hear obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. We know how that ended up. God said, Let them go that they may serve me. Chapter 4, verse 23. Let them go that they may hold a feast unto me. Chapter 5, verse 1. They could not. Now, a question for you. Could God have saved them while they were in Egypt? But is that the way God functions? No. He told them, let's go to chapter 3 of Exodus. Ex chapter 3, let's read verse 7. Get out and stay out. Are you at Exodus 3? Verse 7. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters. Finish that verse. For I know their sorrow. Oh, I like that about God. He knows what you're suffering. And I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. God has said, I have come to bring them out. I can't do with them what I want while they're in Egypt. I have come to bring them out. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Now, go to John 10. John chapter 10. Listen to Jesus Christ, who actually was the one who spoke to Moses, by the way, in the Old Testament. But he wasn't called Jesus then. He got that name when he became human. Matthew 1.21. We're in John chapter 10. Beautiful gospel, the gospel of John, mm. written by the disciple who was closest to Christ and loved Christ more than any of the other 11. So you're looking at an intimate account about Christ when you read the gospel of John. John 10, verse 16, read with me. And other sheep, come on, I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall what? Hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, when they hear the voice of Christ, what will they do? They'll come out. But observe what Christ said. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Which means, here is one fold, and there are other folds. Do you see that? Here's the fold Christ is the head of. He look, I have other people. In other folds. I want them out. In other words, I can't save them if they stay there. I want them out. How do they come out? They shall hear my voice. This is the voice of God. Don't listen for the sound of thunder. This is the voice of God. Are you with me? They shall hear my voice. When they hear it, they'll come out. There shall be one fold. And one shepherd, and Christ says, other sheep I have now. Which means, there are people of God in casinos right now. Are you with me? There are people of God in whorehouses right now. They just need to hear about Jesus Christ and they'll come running out. There are people in gambling dens right now. There are people in drug dens right now. There are hardened criminals in prison right now. And Jesus said, that's my son. Amen. All he needs is to hear. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All he needs is to hear for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All she needs is to hear. If you confess your sins, I'll forgive you. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. They shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, let us go to Revelation. Revelation. We read from verse 1 of Revelation. Our subject Get out and stay out. Let's pray again. Father, we're now into Revelation, the book in which all other books find their fulfillment. Give us wisdom, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You have Revelation 18, reading from verse 1. Are you there? Read with me. And after these things, I saw what? And after these things, I saw what? Another angel come down from heaven having great power. Come on. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried how? Mightily with a strong voice saying what? Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. And a hold of every foul spirit. And a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now read with me. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the... Wrath of a fornication, keep reading, and the kings of the earth have done what? Committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, this is Babylon. Has a, a, an adulterous relationship with the nations of the earth. People prosper through a relationship with Babylon. Listen to verse 4. What does that say? 
And I heard another voice saying what? Come out of her, my people, that ye do what? Be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, look at verse 4 again. Read it for me. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Stop. Did God tell the Israelites, come out of Egypt? Did Jesus say, I have to speak and my people will come out of other folds? Yes, there's a constant call from heaven, come out. But as Jesus said in John 10, 16, other sheep I have. They don't know they're God's people. Which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. It is no different from Revelation 18, 4. Come out of her, who? My people. My people. This time, we're told precisely where they are in Babylon. Babylon in the Bible represents false teaching, opposition to truth, confusion of beliefs. Go to Genesis 11. Genesis 11. If you think you're safe because you're in any church, you're wrong. I mean wrong with a capital W. Only truth can sanctify and save, and it has to be accepted, obeyed by the grace of God. Genesis 11, reading from verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had there for mortar. And they said, Go to, read with me now, let us what? Build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Verse 5. We come on, read with me. And the God came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now you read verse 7. What does that say? Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they what? May not understand one another's speech. What does verse 8 say? So the Lord scattered them, from thence abroad upon the face of them, and he left off to build the city. Now, verse 9 says, therefore, come on, is the name of it called? Mm-hmm. Why? Because the Lord did there, confound the language of, and from thence did the Lord scatter them upon the face. Yes. Now, they were saying different things. Are you with me? God confounded their languages. They started saying different things. <laughs> That's why Babel also means confusion. All saying different things. Babel. That's Babylon. That's the root of Babylon. The Tower of Babel. Archaeologists have excavated towers. They call them ziggurats. At the top of those towers were places reserved a room for worshiping the sun, the stars, the heavenly bodies, and whatever other pagan gods they worship way back then. That's the origin of Babylon. Look at verse 1 again of Genesis 11. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain where? In the land of China. And they dwelt there. That's where they built the cities. Go to Daniel 1. Daniel 1. It's 14 minutes to 7. Daniel 1, we'll read from verse 1 our subject, get out and stay out. Do you have Daniel 1? Reading from verse 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Keep reading now. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Keep reading. With part of the vessels of the house of God. You pick up the next statement. Which he carried into the, the land of Shinar. 
Which nation invaded Jerusalem? The Babylonians. Where did they come from? Shinar. Oh, wow. Are you following me? You go all the way back to Genesis 11 verse 1, that's where those rebellious builders of Babel, that's where they set up shop in China. Where they opposed God, and God had to confuse their languages, they started saying all kinds of things. So Babel, Babylon means gate of the gods, it also means confusion. Now the Bible uses Babylon in Revelation as a symbol of confusion of teachings. Are you following me? Where truth is not elevated where all kinds of contaminated wine is drunk. Go back to Revelation 18. I talked about a contaminated wine. Go back. I have to go to 10 after 7. Please say it's okay. Amen. All right. Okay. Revelation 18. Let's read from verse 1 again. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, what? Come on, read with me. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become the habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now the Bible is saying the system called Babylon is inhabited by demons and devils. But this is not strange. All error originates from Satan. I'm not trying to be harsh. Listen to me carefully. All error originates from Satan because Jesus said in John 8, 44, he's the father of lies. The very first lie was spoken by Satan in heaven. All lies originate from Satan. All truth originates from God. So it's become a, a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit. Now, go with me to uh, sec- uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Talk about a habitation of devils. How can that happen in a church? Oh, yes. The devil is found more often in churches than anywhere else. 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's read from verse 1. Our subject, get out and stay out. Are you there? Read with me. What does it say? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Stop. Give me another word for expressly. Clearly. Give me another word. Directly. Give me another word. What's that? Plainly, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, come on, read that verse, some shall depart from the faith. Keep reading. Giving heed to seducing spirits, come on, and doctrines of devils. Now, John tells us Babylon is inhabited by devils. Listen to me carefully. Did not Jesus say, have I not chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. Not all devils are spirits. Some devils are flesh and blood. (laughs) Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Another word for faith is truth. Giving heed to seducing spirits. Now, give me the first example on earth of a seducing spirit. The serpent. Give me the second example. Eve to Adam. A seducing spirit. Now she did not remain that way, thank God for that. She was, so we have two. One, you couldn't see the devil, he's spiritual, but you could see Eve. Two seducing spirits. So when the revelation says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, that's not shocking. This is truth. This is biblical. Because Peter tells us, not Peter, Paul tells us in Timothy, in the last days, people shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, what is a doctrine of the devil? Any false teaching is a doctrine of the devil. Let's look at what God said. We don't have to go there, you know it. In the day thou eatest thereof, God told Adam what? Thou shalt surely die. The devil said, he shall That's the doctrine of the devil. It went against God's word. Ah, you're not with me. I'm talking to myself. Anything that goes against, thus saith the Lord is a 
Doctrine of devils. Now, let me be bold and hit you right between the eye. The Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath. Whose doctrine is that? God. Sunday is the Sabbath. Whose doctrine is that? The devil. Because it is not, thus saith the Lord. Now, is that nice to say? No. Do people need to hear it? Yes. Millions of millions follow that doctrine of the devil. The Bible says, as early as Genesis 2, verse 17, in the day thou eatest thereof, finish it for me, thou shalt surely, there will be no doubt about the fact you're dead, thou shalt surely die. The Bible teaches us in Genesis 2, 17, the wages of sin is death. Long before the apostle Paul said that in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. God told that to Adam. There are churches today that say the wages of sin is burning forever in hell. So you never die. You just burn and burn. God said the wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid that penalty. That's why Jesus told John when he appeared to him in Revelation 1, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I'm alive forevermore. Jesus said I was dead. Not I was burning in hell for, I was dead. And the first doctrine of devils is that the dead are not really dead. So you go to any non-Adventist funeral, and everyone is in heaven. Al Capone is in heaven. Jack the Ripper is in heaven. He's in heaven looking down. Everyone is in heaven looking down. Because most churches preach, when you die, you go straight to heaven or you... Mm -mm. I've never been to a funeral where someone was in hell looking up. Never. As if funerals make people saints. That's a doctrine of devil. And it is worldwide. Are you with me? Worldwide. God says, come out of that. There are two doctrines that most Christians, if they would change, would be on God's side. One, this business of when you're dead, you're not really dead. The other one is, the seventh day is the Sabbath. I mean, uh, Sunday is the Sabbath. These two cardinal errors, and by the way, those are the two errors that the devil will use and is using to deceive the whole world. Mm -hmm. Two of them, never forget them. Sunday sacredness. There's no such thing. Most people believe it. And the immortality of the soul, meaning you die, you don't really die, you float around. Those are the two greatest errors in the Bible. Jesus says, if you're my people, come out of that system. If you're my people. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Let me give you another big error that is common in that in the Sunday churches. Speaking in tongues. <laughs> There's a popular teaching in evangelical Christianity. The proof of conversion is speaking in tongues. That's not in the Bible. Now, speaking in tongues is in the Bible. Even though Jesus never spoke in tongues. And Paul said, I speak in tongues more than any of you, but I don't. I could, but I don't. You know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 27? Go there with me quickly. I didn't mean to get on that, but the Spirit brought, me to it, brought it to me. Let me deal with it quickly. There may be someone listening who needs to hear this. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. Now, some of you listening may have been part of those churches where people speak in tongues. An entire church is babbling at the same time on a Sunday morning. 1 Corinthians 14, listen to verse 27. I really want you to read with me. Are you there? Not yet? It's 5 to 7. I have 15 minutes. You gave me graciously 10 more. Are you with me? Yes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, continue to be with me, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If any man speak in tongue, verse 27, read with me. Let him, let what? Let it be by two or at the most three. Keep reading. And that by course. Now what does that mean? Who has a, a version different from the King James? Sister Ann, read that for us, please. Listen carefully. If any, verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. If anyone speaks in a tongue, 
Yes. Pause, sister, pause. The Bible says no more than two people should speak in tongues in a church at any time. At the most three, but keep reading. Uh huh. Ah, stop. Each, come on, in turn. That's what the King James means by, in a, by course. You speak, and I keep quiet. Then you speak, so there is order. Are you following me? The Bible says no more than two, maybe on isolated occasions, three. And by course, while I'm speaking, he keeps quiet. Is that what churches do today? You tell me yes or no. No. How do they do it? Everyone babbles. Now, what's the spirit in that? It's not the spirit of God. That's why I believe it's verse 33 which says, God is not the author of Confusion. Because that's confusion. Now, if God is not the author of that, who is the author? Don't tell me. Okay, okay, you told me. <laughs> mm. In a church, Jesus says, come out of that. Now, go to verse 28. Sister, read 28. Listen to 28 now, carefully. As we attack, well, not attack. Yes, we're attacking speaking in tongues as it is done in this modern world. Verse 28, listen carefully to this new version. If there is no interpretation, let him keep silent. stop. Keep quiet. <laughs> Tongues are not to be spoken in any church unless someone can interpret. The Bible says, if there be no interpretation, let him keep quiet in the church. Now, in his home, in his closet, his bathroom, his basement, he can say whatever he likes to God. That's personal. But in a public setting, you see, in church, and I believe the expression, let him keep quiet in the church. Now you tell me, have you ever heard interpretation where you see speaking in tongues? No. Because the people themselves don't know what they're saying. I'm not trying to be cruel, but I have to speak so that someone gets hits between the eye. And people do this every Sunday. Every Sunday. And they can only do it on Sunday mornings between 11 and 1. They can't speak in tongues on Tuesday. If you have a gift, you have a gift. And millions do that. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The way, notice I said, the way tongues are performed in this modern world, that's the demonic way. That's not the biblical way. What's our subject? Get out. Stay out. And Jesus says to his people in Babylon, come out of her my people. Which means there must be a voluntary decision. Amen. Christ doesn't say, I'll grab you and pull you out. You come out. Make that, mm -hmm. Make that decision. Come out. And be separate. And touch not the unclean things, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. My brothers and sisters, some of you need to make decisions to be baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. Is it a perfect church? Absolutely not, because I'm in it. Are you following me? It can't be perfect. Well, don't say amen too loudly. It can be perfect, because I'm in it. Jesus said, have I not chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. Does the Adventist church have devils? Yes, yes. don't say it so loudly, but yes. <laughs> Did Jesus say the wheat and tares must go together? Yes. But when disciples left Christ because they did not like what he said in John 6, 66, Jesus said to the twelve, will he also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And the words of eternal life are the words of truth. Sunday as the Sabbath is not the words of eternal life. People living after they're dead, it are, that's not the words of eternal life. Everyone speaking in so-called tongues at the same time and babbling, that's not the words of life. Right. 
those of you online in person, make a decision. If you're online, contact the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church. Tell them you want to be baptized. A little of some studies before, baptize. Because Jesus said, study, teach, baptize, teach. Or oh, rebaptized. Oh, yes, thanks, Pastor. You, know, you need to be rebaptized. And there are 12 disciples in the book of Acts, chapter 19. Paul met them. And they said, Paul said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, We've never heard, even if there's a Holy Ghost. Paul taught them. The Bible says in verse 5 of uh, for, uh, John, Acts 19, when they heard what Paul taught, they were all baptized again. They were disciples. Some of you listening to me right now, online in person, you need to be baptized or rebaptized. Amen. And for those of you who are Adventists, and you ponder rebaptism, evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. When a soul is truly reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, come out and stay out. Some of you listening need to come out of Babylon. And Babylon represents confusion of teachings that are not based on thus saith the Lord. Amen. And the major ones are, one, that Sunday is a Sabbath, absolutely wrong. That teaching originated in hell, but was mediated through human agents. The other one that's wrong, that when you die, you're not really dead. You either go to heaven immediately, hell immediately. If you're a sinner, you burn forever. That originated with Satan. And those are the two demonic, satanic, and hellish teachings that have deceived most of the Christian world. <laughs> Let me pause on this demonic teaching that Sunday is a Sabbath. There isn't one text in the Bible that calls the first day holy. Not one. But that's not strange that people would behave that way, believe something that's not in the Bible. Go back to the Garden of Eden. You don't have to, you don't have to go in your mind, in your mind. How were the trees made? Come on, come on, come on. By the word of God. Mm, God said. How were the heavenly bodies made? By the word of God. The animals, the word of God. Water and dry land, the word of God. The birds, the fish, the word of God. Now, Grass, the word of God. Now Eve, when she stood under that tree, she was standing on grass made how? The word of God. Looking into the tree made how? By the word of God. Listening to a serpent made how? By the word of God. Are you with me? Which means she was surrounded by proof of the power of God's word. Mm -hmm. When the devil said, you shall not surely die, what proof did she have? That his word had power. None. Yet, she chose, come on, his word. Now, the Bible is full of evident proof. The seventh day is the Sabbath. People stand in a garden of proof that the seventh day is the Sabbath, yet they choose the word of the devil. And keep Sunday. Even when they find out that the Sabbath is the seventh day. Then they argue, well, any day is a day. No, any day is not a day. The Bible never says, remember a Sabbath to keep it. It says, remember the Sabbath. The Sabbath is different from a Sabbath. If I were to say to you, bring me a fruit, you bring anything. If I say, bring me the fruit, what will you ask me? Which fruit? Remember the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. The day that God blessed, sanctified. Are you a child of God? You love God, obey Him. And so I call upon you online, in person, make a decision. What's our subject for tonight? Get out, Get out come on, and stare. If you're in a church that practices tongues, get out. Did I say get out clearly enough? Get out. God's greatest enemy on this earth is not a political organization. It's a religious system called Babylon. Are you listening to me? The Israelites' great enemy back then was Babylon. 
yes, a, a, a political organization, but used by the Bible as a symbol of God's enemy in these last days, Babylon the great whore. If you're in a church that observes Sunday as a Sabbath, get out. And come where God's law is respected. Come where truth is upheld. Not where everyone is perfect. No, come where thus said the Lord is taught. Amen. I invite you to consider becoming a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A church who recognizes one of its missions is to magnify the law of God as a standard of living. A church that recognizes one of its missions is to expose Babylon for what it really is. A church system that's run by the devil. Go to Revelation 13 quickly, then I'll let you go. Revelation 13. When I said a church system run by the devil, you may have been shocked. Let's go to Revelation 13 quickly. We read verses 1 to 4. Father in heaven, I'm coming to a close. Please, please, God, give me the right words as I end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you have Revelation 13? Reading from verse 1, now put a smile on my face. Read with me. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of the lion. And the dragon gave him his what? His power and his seat and great authority. Who is the dragon? Tell me quickly. Satan. Verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. That's an account of the papacy that was uh, abolished in 1798, but came back into power in 1929 under Mussolini. Are you following me? Now read verse 4. You read, I'll listen. And they worship, come on, the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, that religious system. And they worship the beast. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They worship the dragon and the beast. Now, they're not seeing the dragon. They're only seeing the beast. But when you worship the beast, you're really doing what? Worshiping David. Worship mm -hmm. In a church. In a church. No wonder the Bible says in Revelation 12 verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. Of course, except those in Hammond. Hmm? Don't be deceived. Accept truth. Jesus says to you tonight, you're my child. Come out. Come out. Don't come out like Lot's wife looking back. Come out. Make a decision to be baptized. You don't have to be baptized tomorrow or the day after. Make the decision. Are you with me? Make the decision to baptize or rebaptize to start all over with God. Make that decision. Online, find an Adventist church near you. Wherever you are, there must be one. Here in Hammond, you make that decision. Do we have cards? Give me a few cards. Quickly. I want you to write on the card. If you're convicted by God's Spirit to be baptized or rebaptized and follow truth. Just, just raise your hands if you need a card. Raise your hand if you need a card. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Someone else, raise a hand. You need a card. Just write on that card a decision. Remember, it's just a decision. It's not setting a date. A decision. Decisions are powerful things. They give you freedom. A, a, a weight falls off your shoulder. I've made a choice. Someone else, I want to be baptized at some point. Raise your hand. Two over here. Get a card. Or, or rebaptize. Start all over. You'll be surprised how many Adventists need to be rebaptized. The young people who got baptized because their friends were being baptized, they had no clue what they were doing. They need to be baptized again. If you're online, make that decision. Write your name, pass that card over to the pastor. How many of you will say, Father, help me to follow truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth? Can I see your hand? Stand up with me, please. Thank you for the extra time. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for the message. Tough, right between the eyes. But Father, you know my heart. I want to see people follow, thus saith the Lord, dear God. 
Truth is not that hard to understand if we will listen honestly. Dear God, there are people in error in Babylon right now. They only need to hear, thus saith the Lord, and they will leave. Dear God, I pray that someone who listened tonight in person or online fits that description and will get up and leave right now by a decision in the mind. Father, remind all those who listen that truth sets people free. Error binds them in chains and handcuffs and shackles. Do all you can to convict people to leave Babylon, dear God. Leave churches where people observe Sunday as the Sabbath. Leave churches where people speak in tongues all at the same time, contrary to the Bible. Leave churches where people believe that the lost will burn in hell forever, contrary to the Bible. Give them the courage to leave and to follow truth. They'll be glad they did. As we leave, let's contemplate what we've heard, I pray. Bless everyone who listened. Special blessing on the little boys and girls. Bring us back tomorrow, dear God, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated. Remember to turn those cards to the pastor when you're finished.